Hello, good evening, and welcome to the latest Tune In Tuesday with Cicerone Press. Um, this is the final of our series of Tune In Tuesday events uh, that we set up to kind of inspire you about getting out and about during lockdown. Um, so yeah, really excited to be back with um, another event. And this week we're talking about trekking in Tajikistan with Jan Bakker. Um, but if you, I guess if you're new here and you haven't actually watched any of our previous events before, we've had uh, nine events so far and a real mix of different activities, different places. So um, if you enjoy this and you want to find out more about those other events, we had uh, several on kind of Camino and pilgrimage routes. So the Way of St Francis, the Via Francigena, um, what was the other one? Oh, and the Camino del Norte. Um, and also uh, the Kulin Ridge in Sky and um, one's about running, mental health and long distance trekking. So there's really plenty um, for you to watch if you are interested in that. And yeah, you can find those on our YouTube channel, um, on our website and also on Facebook if that's where you're watching. So yeah, plenty um, to watch and get inspired by. Um, tonight, as always, uh, we are taking questions from you um, and putting them to our guests. So if you have questions as we're going through, um, you can put them as comments on Facebook. Um, you can also ask them on Zoom if you're in the webinar. Um, and yeah, you can tweet us um, them at, at Cicerone Press or send them to live at cicerone.co.uk. Um, so whatever questions you have, plenty of ways to get involved and send us them. Um, and yeah, hopefully you're going to be as inspired about Tajikistan um, as I have been and as our guest definitely is. Um, so it is a delight to be joined by Jan Bakker this evening, um, who was born in a village below sea level in northwest of the Netherlands. He saw his first mountain at the age of 15 and was instantly sold. Jan is a jack of all trades as far as the outdoors and adventures are concerned. Uh, he worked as an outdoor instructor in Belgium, managed an environmental charity called Respect the Mountains and sold woolly hats to outdoor stores in Scotland. More recently, he co-founded the very first mountain film festival in Tunisia and has been leading pioneering mountaineering expeditions in Tajikistan, the Afghan Wakhan Corridor and Iraqi Kurdistan. He has written articles about his adventures for Sidetracked, Trek and Mountain magazine and Adventure Travel magazine and is the co-author of Cicerone's Guide to Trekking in Tajikistan. And um, so, yeah, massive welcome to Jan. Um, who is joining us today from Uganda. Um, hi, Jan. <laughs> good, so, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. So if we yeah, run into any technical issues, I think it might be a combination of Cumbrian thunderstorms that we've been having over the past few days and uh, potentially the Ugandan internet. <laughs> yes, so far so good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're doing well today. Um, yeah. So yeah, Jan, you're here to inspire us about Tajikistan, um, which I know when I started at Cicerone, it was going through production and it was a place that I hadn't heard of before. Um, but the photographs of the area and the landscape are just absolutely wonderful. Um, so I thought it'd be a really great chance for you to introduce the area and kind of take our audience through um, an introduction to Tajikistan and the culture and the area. All right, I'd be delighted to. I'll uh, share my screen. I prepared um, a slideshow to give uh, an impression of Tajikistan as a country and, uh, and also where it actually is. Let's hold on one second. Uh, right. Play from the start. Right. So, yeah, many people um, have not even heard of Tajikistan or don't really know how to place it. So it's this tiny country um, in the heart of Central Asia. Um, it's west of China, north of Afghanistan, um, east of Uzbekistan and south of Kyrgyzstan. So it's really wedged in all uh, stands that are a bit more famous uh, to, um, uh, to most people. Um, if you take a closer look, you see a lot of dark brown that, that indicates that it's a, um, a very mountainous country. Uh, in fact, it's 93% of the country is, uh, is mountainous. Um, 
yeah, it's it's a sparsely po the, the mountains are sparsely populated. Uh, it has a population of 9.5 million people, but most people live in the in the lower parts of uh, of the country. Uh, most of them in Dushanbe and Gujant, the, the the main cities. Um, the whole eastern part um, is is the primaries. It's almost 50 percent of uh, of the country, and um, there's only 230,000 people living there. So you can imagine it's uh, it's quite an empty land uh, um, in this this part of Tajikistan. Um, but not many people know that it's it's actually the third highest country in the world. So you've got Bhutan and Nepal, and just behind it is uh, is Tajikistan with uh, an average of 3,100 meters. It's it's quite unbelievable, especially for me coming from below sea level. Um, so yeah, it's it's um, there's there's mountains wherever you go essentially, and even where it's uh, not not considered mountainous, it's not even flat. It's still hilly. So uh, yeah, it's a uh, it's a true paradise for uh, for 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 outdoor uh, and mountain tourists. Um, uh, uh, Size-wise, so um, yeah, you can compare it. It's, it's slightly smaller than Wales and England combined. So it's actually, it's not that, that big. Uh, although travel times, um, as you can imagine, you know, it takes a lot longer to go from A to B because the, the roads are uh, not always in a, a perfect condition. <laughs> So landscape-wise, um, the, in the, the guidebook, in Trekking at Tichikistan, we divided the, um, the, the mountain areas in the northern ranges and, uh, and the Pamirs. So I'll start to talk a little bit about the northern ranges. Um, this is the Fan Mountains, probably the most popular part uh, for trekkers uh, in Tajikistan because it's close to uh, Dushanbe. It's like two and a half, three hour drive. Um, and it's a really stunning, compact mountain area with lots of uh, pathways. Um, it's quite a, quite a few people roaming these uh, these mountains. Local people, shepherds, uh, but it's all very steep. So uh, lots of steep passes. Really big mountains, uh, over five thousand meters, um, and it's um, yeah, it's a very accessible place to uh, to, to visit. Uh, you can see this lake uh, down here brilliant lakes even the glaciers go to quite low so you can you can walk to the snout of a glacier at three and a half thousand meters uh, in the right top corner you can um, you can, you can the glacier of Chabdara easy to reach within a couple of hours and if you go further east um, it becomes a lot greener um, lots of um, precipitation and yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit like the Alps, but maybe 500 years ago. So it's really, um, uh, yeah, without the gondolas and way marks. And, um, but it, it looks a lot like the Alps. It's also similar altitude, all around 10 meters. The height is just over 5,000. So it's a little bit higher than Mont Blanc. Uh, and also here is a network of trails, uh, which is ideal for hiking. And if you go further south uh, to the, um, to the uh, Pamirs, um, there's also quite a depth in landscape. So we've got Zaroshku, um, uh, which is a lake at 4,500. Um, it's, it's, that's an area with lots of mountain lakes. Uh, every night you can camp on a different lake and um, it's, it's, it's quite stunning. Very lush, very, lots of glaciers, lots of water. Uh, the valleys are very green as well. So um, it's, it's um, and, and no, hardly any people you can just track there and not meeting anyone for days and finally this this photo was taken right on the edge of the Murga plateau so that's a high altitude desert it's a lot drier as you can see uh, uh, more flattened out but everything is above 3,500 meters and, uh, and the peaks you see in the distance um, you know they're probably over 5,000 meters so it's a uh, it's a very harsh landscape lots of wind as well um, a lot harder to trek in. Uh, finding water is also a challenge. So uh, finally, this this landscape you can only find in the the, the heart of the Pamirs, the um, yeah where the, the proper high mountains are. So in the background is the highest mountain in Tajikistan, uh, Ismail Somoni, seven thousand four hundred ninety-five meters, taken from about six thousand five hundred, and the, the tents really give scale. So here are the big glaciers. It's a bit comparable to. Uh, um, I guess the the, the Hindu Kush and the um, Chen Shan Mountains. So it's it's all kind of the same system as well. 
which they call the Pamir Knot, where all the big, uh, the greater ranges in Asia come together. Um, yeah, transportation. So this is this is a, a minibus that I took to, uh, into the Fan Mountains, uh, but it's really hard to find buses that are actually going to the small villages uh, in the mountains. So it's it's quite hard to uh, to get around um, uh, on the budget. You basically, need to hire a private vehicle to uh, to get around. Uh, and as said, you know, there's a big network of trails uh, everywhere in the mountains uh, carved out by the, the shepherds, um, by people who, who travel from village to village uh, and they take on really big passes. So uh, it's, yeah, you don't have to build trails here, they're there for, uh, for the hiker to take. And, um, but yeah, the, the mountains are not empty. You will meet quite a few people. You will get invited by these people in their homes, uh, their temporary summer homes. So in the winter, it's too cold to live up there. So they, um, um, yeah, they offer you tea or a bowl of yogurt, uh, fresh bread. And um, although it's quite hard to communicate possibly with them, uh, unless you speak Russian or Tajik or Pamiri. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's really fun to kind of have a peek into their daily life and see, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite tough living up there, as you can imagine. Uh, there's no fruit, no vegetables. Uh, people live off, yeah, just uh, milk, meat. Um, so it's uh, it's quite quite hard to live up there. Um, but they're yeah they're very hospitable, and you know you 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 will you will have to decline a few invitations for tea, otherwise you won't get, get anywhere while walking. Uh, <laughs> Which of course it's a uh, it's a good thing. I mean it's uh, it's it's great to um, yeah to be among the people. Otherwise the mountains would be quite empty and lonely. Uh, I would say. So um, yeah, that's that that's a short introduction to uh, Tajikistan. Um, shall I un unshare my screen? Um, hold on. Yeah, yeah. Let's do that and then. And we can see each other again. Hi. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, Jan, that was brilliant. Um, I think what's really nice is you've given that sense of, you know, it's obviously a remote area with a really diverse landscape, you know, quite a small area, really. Um, yeah. But, it, you know, it's not remote in terms of the people and the culture and that there are so many trails going through it. Um, and, yeah, you know, all those people who are going to welcome you um, into their communities and their home. Um, so I think that's that's such a nice mix, I think, in a in a country. Yeah, it's a great mix. Yeah, I agree. Um, so I guess we have talked about how, well, you have talked about how it is a remote area. And in the guidebook, there is loads of information about safety and accommodation and visas and health precautions and, you know, the right kit to take and all of that. Um, but what was the biggest challenge that you actually faced while you were in Tajikistan? Um, well, I guess the, the, the transport is really hard. So some of the trailheads are very remote. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really hours and hours of driving. So it's either, if you have a bigger budget, um, you, you could rent a private vehicle that makes it easy. Uh, at the time of research, well, I, I didn't have a lot of money and I spent four months in, uh, in Central Asia to research. So it was really hard. I found it really hard to, uh, um, yeah, to get to the trailheads and, uh, you know, you, you basically have to either find people you share a car with or you wait for a full week to hop on a bus, the weekly bus, to, to get to the trailhead. So that's uh, a real challenge. And then you, you end somewhere that's also remote. So, um, yeah, to plan all that is, um, yeah, it takes, a bit, it takes a bit of planning, I guess. Uh, but, um, and, and maybe also a bit of budget to 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 you know is if worst comes to worst you need to get your international flight that you can actually uh, go back to uh, civilization again so uh, yeah that was the biggest challenge <laughs> so i guess yeah <laughs> i guess i think you said this the other day when we had a chat but you either need time or you need money that's it yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah and then you know, with it being a remote area and having to get to these remote trailheads, um, how do you make sure that you stay safe while you're out there um, and also trekking through these remote regions? 
Yeah, so Jenny, I would say it's 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 very safe to uh, trek in these mountains. The, the, the people are very welcoming, uh, and if you're in trouble, they, they will help you. Um, and even if you're not in trouble, they still try to help you, and sometimes wonder what what you're doing there. But um, yeah, it is remote, and that's that's that that is a reality of trekking in Tajikistan. Uh, medical uh, facilities are are far away, um, so you have to plan ahead really well, what, what are you bringing? Um, so what, one of the things, um, uh, um, yeah, I did my first research in 2010 and people warned me about wolves and bears and, and that's, you know, it was, that, that was the least of my problems. Uh, water is generally, drinking water is generally uh, a bit of an issue because there's a lot of, lot of livestock. Uh, and my, my personal philosophy is, you know, uh, being healthy is being being able to take care of yourself uh, and if 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 you have well if you get sick um you know you, you could be in a in a bad place uh, i think map reading is an essential skill uh, knowing how to use a map because you're far away from any phone reception um this a gps can run out of batteries uh, and luckily the 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 russians in the 80s and 90s mapped out um, the the Tajik mountains really well on a very small uh, small scale, like 100, one to 100, uh, 50, one to 50,000. So you can actually use these maps to uh, navigate in the mountains uh, and use that as a backup. And luckily, it's it's a lot easier to um, uh, to navigate than, for instance, in Scotland because the, the the landscape is so big that it's well, it's quite hard to get lost, I would say. And the weather is generally a lot better than in Scotland too. So um, <laughs> yeah, so. You know, if you can make it in Scotland, you'll be fine in Tajikistan, I would say. Uh, also, one thing I would mention is that um, trails can be quite treacherous because uh, in, in springtime, uh, there's quite a few landslides, uh, avalanches, and they can take out a path. So you, you could come across a place where the path is, has just vanished. And <clears throat> the local shepherds, local guys, they're all, you know, they're very quick on their feet and they're used to it. But you know, you could feel yourself quite wobbly and the drops can be quite big. So yeah, I would say always go for your own judgment and uh, make sure, you know, you're okay with uh, uh, going into this treacherous uh, section of, uh, of trail. Um, because for them it's, it's easy, but, you know, they don't really, they don't really have the awareness that, um, that, that you may not be, you not maybe may not be used to that kind of uh, terrain. So, uh, if, if it's yes. more treacherous in the springtime, when is the best time to actually go? Uh, that's a good question. It, it's actually more treacherous in springtime because then you've got all the snow melt. Uh, rivers are, the river levels are very high. So crossing a river would be quite challenging. Uh, bridges may, may have been taken out. Um, uh, and, and as said, you know, landslides occur quite often. So yeah that makes it uh, quite a, a hard time to go so i would say um, the second half of june until september maybe even october could be uh, is the best time i think september is the best month to go because it's quite empty the rivers are low uh, passes are snow free so um yeah i have to say it doesn't seem like the sort of place that you want to go solo trekking well, that's what I did the first four months, and that's, <laughs> was it was actually uh, yeah. And and in some parts of the mountains, you're 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 not alone in the sense that you meet a lot of local people. But when you go along, of course, you need to plan it really well. Uh, it, it's all about planning because there's no shops around the corner. You need to plan your food, uh, but you can't take too much, obviously, because you need to carry everything yourself. Uh, and it's sustained hiking at high altitude, uh, crossing some passes, maybe bad terrain. So uh, I think if you if you plan it well, um, yeah, you you it, it's it's a delight actually. Uh, you wake up in a mountain range that that sees hardly any other trekkers. So unlike uh, some other mount, mountain areas in uh, in the Himalayas. So it's uh, I think the, the solitude is really appealing um, and. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't recommend it for uh, people who just started trekking. It's, it's, it, it is quite a place to be, to have some experience. Uh, because as I said, you know, if things 
don't go as planned, you know, help is, is pretty far away. Um, and I would, I would advise to bring a set phone or um, uh, there's these satellite messages like Spot and InReach, uh, Garmin InReach, where you can, you know, should you uh, sprain an ankle badly, which could potentially be uh, quite dangerous, uh, you could let people know and um, the people at home can set up uh, a rescue operation. So, um, yeah. Can I ask why, like, what drew you to Tajikistan in the first place? What, what brought me to Tajikistan? Yeah, just because it, like, it's obviously a beautiful remote area. Um, but, you know, I feel like most people haven't really heard of it. So, like, why did you decide to go there for four months? Yeah, um, the first time I heard about Tajikistan was uh, traveling along the Karakoram Highway uh, from Pakistan to China, from Islamabad to um, Kashgar. And there was a guy uh, with a bike on the bus. Uh, he said, yeah, I'm going to cycle in Tajikistan. Uh, and I thought, wow. And we, we drove along the border, essentially. And uh, it was sort of the, the, that, that planted the seed. And then my, my wife works for an NGO, international NGO. So for her work, she had to go to Tajikistan. And uh, nice. I said, let's make a holiday. So we went cycle touring for uh, three weeks uh, in the Pamirs and the Wahan Corridor. And uh, yeah, and I was sold, you know, uh, I, I couldn't find any information about hiking. So it was a eureka moment for me to think, wow, there's, there's nothing, no information about trekking or anything here. Uh, let's do something about it. <laughs> and so I did after quite a few years. Yeah, it's, that's so nice to hear because I think your enthusiasm for it really comes through. Um, and yeah, I just wondered why and I guess it's that thing isn't it just overhearing other people talking about stuff that's kind of the joy of traveling isn't it um, yeah, yeah. get those little seeds it, it is. Yeah, yeah it really is yeah yeah Gosh. well um so you co-authored the guidebook with Christine Oriel um who I don't know if I pronounced that right uh, but she's the co-director of an organization called Women Rocking Pamirs um, which trains women up to be trekking guides and encourages women to go trekking in Tajikistan. Um, yeah. You know, do you think as a woman it's ne kind of necessary to be part of a group like that to go to Tajikistan, or can you do it? I guess. Um, well, you know, uh, there's there's no doubt Tajikistan can be a challenging place for uh, for a solo woman to travel. I mean, uh, it's quite a conservative country. Um, and I think, but I think Christine's organization, it's an amazing initiative uh, and it also empowers women to become guides. And I think, yeah, breaking that, that gender bias, I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful initiative and it's quite successful. Uh, um, necessary, um, I don't think it's necessary. There are quite a few reputable uh, local trekking companies uh, and they either have men or f male or female guides and, uh, and in both ways, it's uh, you can trust them to to take a uh, women either solo or a uh, group of women um, uh, safely through the mountains. So, uh, but it's yeah again, um, I worked for an, uh, for a, a British um, uh, tour operator called Untamed Borders, uh, and they they employ also guides uh, who are linked to um, uh, women uh, rock and palmiers. So, you know, it's, uh, you can also have both. They can, they, they can also uh, um, join other groups and other companies to work for. And that's actually why it's, it's set up, to, to empower them to work for various uh, trekking companies, also international ones. Maybe as a, a wider question then, do you think, you know, you talked about like how difficult it can be to plan this sort of trip. And I imagine for your first four month trip, you didn't, um, you know, go with a tour operator, but would you would you suggest that people do that? Uh, yeah, it, I mean, it opens quite a few doors. Also, you know, the, the langu language is, is quite a barrier. And if you want to know more about uh, the way people live, uh, you know, what, what people are doing in the mountains, uh, how they live in wintertime, um obviously that's that's it's, it's quite an uh it opens a conversation with the the locals um also it's i mean as, as i said before the terrain can be quite treacherous and the local 
guides, the local companies, they know where the uh, where a bridge has been washed away or uh, where a, a part of the trail has disappeared. So uh, for safety, yeah, you, you could you could definitely argue that uh, going with a local company is uh, is a good idea. Plus, the local economy benefits from people who are hiring porters and uh, um, and guides and cooks. So I, I would always encourage uh, for a, a better experience uh, and to yeah to boost the local economy uh, to uh, to hire a, a local team and it's good fun. <laughs> yeah, and that kind of sense of supporting the local economy is something that you're really pushing to do with the Pamir Trail, isn't it? Which we're going to talk about, um, I guess, shortly actually. Um, but yeah, in terms of supporting. The local community as well um you know they seem like a very hospitable people and that you might have the opportunity to have a kind of homestay um so could you explain how that works and how that benefits the locals yeah absolutely i'll uh, i'll share my screen again and show you uh, what a homestay looks like uh on the inside so uh just Can you, no, that was not it. So are you seeing the, the, okay, yeah, excellent, okay. Um, So uh, the Aga Khan Foundation, which is uh, uh, quite a big organization in Tajikistan, set up a network of uh, of homestays uh, in the premieres uh, for people to be able to to sleep in various places in very remote parts of the premieres, but also to, yeah, to, generate extra income tour, tourism income uh, for um, remote places because um, obviously uh, hard cash is is very welcome in these places where cash is not really uh, available um, you know people live off uh, agriculture and, uh, uh, and if something breaks then you know it's, it's often a big problem so yeah tourism does bring in quite quite a lot of money and um, and therefore, I think it's you know homestays is a perfect way to introduce the tourists to to you know to show to show the way of living in the in the mountains, um, and they benefit from it uh, by just earning money essentially. So this is um, this was in two thousand nine um, uh, in Bulukul, uh, which is at three thousand seven hundred fifty meters, very high, coldest place in Central Asia, in fact. And uh, but inside it, you can see it's warm. Um, uh, they, they always have a, like a, a heater going. Uh, drinking lo- drinking local tea, sometimes uh, yak butter tea, because uh, yaks are uh, um, are quite common in this area, uh, just like in Tibet. Um, and um, yeah, enjoy enjoying local food as well. So um, uh, you basically sleep with a whole. There's there's one area where uh, uh, where the guests stay. So you might be sharing it with uh, with a bunch of other people, um, but yeah, you can share stories, and uh, I think it adds to the experience. So, um, and then, yeah, sometimes when you're stuck for accommodation and people notice, they they will take you in. Um, uh, yeah, I, I I mean, hospitality is really in their DNA, and if if they see you, you're well, it's late in the day. You have no place to stay. You probably have no tent with you. Um, they will invite you in uh, first for tea, and then they ask you whether you want to stay. Uh, and before you know it, you uh, you spend the night in somebody's home, which is quite unimaginable in many places where we are from. So, uh, um, yeah, it's a it's a wonderful uh, experience. Is there a, a particular homestay experience that kind of stays with you? Um, I mean, I'm sure they're all wonderful, but yeah, anyone in particular? Yeah, so that same cycling trip in 2009, we, uh, me and my wife spent uh, quite a bit of time, about 4,000 meters camping and a bit roughing it, uh, very cold. And then we descended into the Waha Corridor, which is uh, shares a border with uh, Afghanistan. And it's infamous for its winds. Uh, they're called the 120-day winds. So we had headwind all the time, the whole... Uh, from from the the riverbed, all the sand had had blown onto the the road, so it was really tough going. And uh, end of the day, we 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 weren't going to make our planned homestay, so um, yeah, we, we were a bit in despair, grumpy, hungry, 
and then a little kid came to us, uh, beckoning us, come here, uh, come, come, come and stay in our place. Because he spoke three words of English and we, we stayed in this wonderful home. Um, people, you know, uh, serving us a hearty meal, um, giving us warm water to wash because we probably looked quite, quite mucky. Uh, yeah, it was fantastic. And you wake up and you see the Hindu Kush in front of you um, and get a lovely breakfast and, well, you're good to go again. So, so yeah, th that also sold me on Tajikistan, that, mm -hmm. that, th that night stay in that, you know, random, random people's place. Yeah, it's amazing. It sounds like a really great way to immerse yourself in a whole country and a and a culture. Uh, it is, yeah, because uh, and, and even if you pay for it, it's it's very cheap. Um, you, you get dinner, breakfast, and uh, and a night stay for fifteen to twenty dollars per person, and then you can really experience what you know. You, you can see uh, what what people's life is about and. Um, so yeah, you really immerse yourself into uh, the, the rural Taji culture, for sure. And I guess if you stay with a family or a community and it's not a kind of formal homestay, um, is it good practice to kind of leave something for them as way of thanks? Yeah, that's, 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 they, will, they will refuse to offer, but um, yeah, it's, it's, you have to make find a way to what we always did was we just left it in a corner so they would find it uh, because they you know they will refuse you ask three times they still refuse uh, or you give it to the oldest child that's also uh, quite common but um, yeah it's uh, I mean they feed you and it's for them it's it's quite an offer so uh, you know it's it's a good idea it's just to uh, leave the equivalent basically of what, what you would pay uh, at a homestay, so about $15, 20 yeah. yeah, oh, you know, it sounds absolutely wonderful. And uh, <laughs> um, my, my housemate actually was, she thought, because I had a book for Tajikistan that I was planning to go there um, all of a sudden, and actually it's sounding quite amazing. <laughs> yeah, so she's going next year then. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she might be convinced. Uh, we've got quite a lot of questions actually uh, from the audience. So I'm much more Um You mentioned that water is difficult to get hold of, um, but how do you do that? How do you get a daily water supply when you're out in these? Um, yeah, just make sure you, well, you you do follow rivers quite a lot. In the east eastern uh, Pamirs, it's uh, it's quite hard, but um, like in the central Pamirs and also in the Fen Mountains, it's quite easy to find wa uh, water. The only thing is that. Obviously, where there's a lot of people with livestock, uh, the water will probably be contaminated. So you need to purify it or filter it uh, in order to to make sure it's safe. Because uh, you know, quite a few people I know have become sick just uh, just because of the water. So, um, but yeah, w water supply is in in the more western part of the Pamirs is not so much of a problem. Um, on kind of hygiene, we've got a question about food hygiene as well, um, and whether that's a challenge. Yeah, it can also be a challenge. Uh, things like butter, uh, you know, when it goes off, they will probably still serve it. Uh, some homestays hardly see any visitors, uh, so they kind of scramble uh, food together just to be able to uh, uh, to accommodate the, the guest. But um, yeah, it's, I mean, in all fairness, it, it people do to do get sick and uh you know and when you go trekking you, you need with a group you need to insist that all your your cook and the whole the staff just um sanitize their hands especially these days of course but even in non covid times it's 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 a good idea to urge them to uh, to wash their hands yeah and if um if you're setting out for i don't know a week two weeks do you need to be carrying all your supplies with you for that period or can you pick up stuff while you're on the trail? Uh, it depends a bit on the route. I mean, there are some really remote routes where there's, there's consecutive days where you cannot really stock up. Uh, in some areas, it's a bit easier. So it, it really depends on the route. Um, uh, in, in trekking in Tajikistan, I try to kind of link up routes as well. And then 
uh, with with a possible small village where you could stock up on the basics like uh, some rice or uh, noodle soups or it I mean it it won't be um, there won't be very well stocked supermarkets but you know you can you can still find shops uh, quite remotely but yeah it's all about planning um, in some places there's nothing you, you kind of have to assume you have to carry everything I guess it's always good isn't it when you're trekking to have a backup of some supplies because you never know what's going to happen really yeah I think what I always did was I I, I would take freeze-dried food uh, and these days freeze-dried food is, is very tasty so uh, it saves you a ton of weight. Yeah. Um, gosh, so many questions today. Um, we've also got another question about um, kind of the guides that are available. And I think you said that they do bridge the language barrier. So I imagine that they speak English. Yes, some of them, yeah. Usually the... Uh, the, the the people who are employed as a trekking guide, they, they speak some le level of English, enough to, um, to kind of communicate the, the basic needs. Some speak better English. Uh, I've seen quite a few English teachers actually having a, a side job as a guide. Um, oh. So, yeah. Wow. That's a good idea. Yeah, that's, yeah, that sounds really good. Um, and then we've got another question about visas which i know you have quite a big section in the book about correct visas and how to get those yeah uh, but yeah asking yeah. when you spent several months in tajikistan what visa did you have and I guess um yeah so i had at the time it was a lot harder you had to go to a f physically to an embassy to get a visa uh, it has become a lot easier actually um e-visas are available online um, we can we can share that link later um, mm. and it's um, yeah you can get a these days a 60-day visa uh, it costs you fifty dollars plus if you go to the premieres you need a gbao permit but that's you just have to tick a box and then, then that that's dealt with as well so it's uh yeah you can do it all online uh, for 90 nationalities so Obviously, in, for some countries, it does not apply and they have to go to an embassy. But all the EU citizens, US, Australian, uh, yeah, they, they're eligible for, uh, for an e-visa. So it's, it's, it's easy, quick and, and efficient. And in terms of your insurance, and um, this is from Fiona, was that through your wife's NGO organization or um, was that a separate thing? Uh, no, it was simply through World Nomads, uh, which is quite a common uh, travel insurance. Um, you just have to tick a few extra boxes, the, the altitude you're doing. So I think above 4,000 meters trekking, you, you pay an extra premium. Uh, but other than that, it was, it was really simple. Um, yeah, just through World Nomads. So. I think it does seem like it's all very manageable if you've planned and you've got it all sorted. Um, yeah. Across. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, I think, but it's, it's all about tracking. Uh, it's all about planning. Uh, I, I think that that applies to yeah, most uh, tracking trips, especially if you want to do it solo. I mean, if you want to do coast to coast Scotland, you need mm. to plan it pretty well as well, because you can get in, into a lot of trouble. So, um, yeah, but no, no matter rescue in Tajikistan. That's that's <laughs> different. Is that not at all? I suppose, yeah. Uh, not, yeah, not at all. No, you're on, on your own. Gosh. Um. So we're going to talk next about the Pamir Trail. Um. But I should just mention to the audience that if you've been inspired about trekking in Tajikistan, um, we are offering a twenty-five percent discount on. Jan's book, um, Jan and Christine's book, um, Trekking in Tajikistan. So if you go to the Cicerone website and um, yeah, put the book in your basket and then you could type in the discount code PAMIR25. So that's capital P A M I R 25. Um, yeah, 25% off the book at full price. Um, and we're also doing free UK postage 
Um, so yes, if you're inspired and you want to find out more, and there is so much information for all the planning, um, it's quite a big introduction really. So yeah, plenty there. Um, you can find out more about the practicalities and actually the routes that this goes on. Um, so yeah, that's there. Premier 25 on the Cicero website for 25% off on the printed book. Thank you, Amy. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, the Premier Trail. Um, Jan, this has been something that you've been thinking about through lockdown. Um, yeah. So I wonder if you could talk us through kind of what it is, your vision for it, um, and yeah, how it's going to help. Yeah, so I'll, shall I just share um, my, yes, my, my the map and the route? Yes. That's probably Perfect. Uh, let's see. Um, I'm just going to share screen. I'm not so used to this, uh, <laughs> as you can imagine. Uh, can you, can you, uh, no. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, we're get, we're getting there. Sorry. <laughs> right. right. I think it's up now. Right. I think it'll be worth the wait. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, so, there we go. Right. So, um, be, because there is such a fast network of trails uh, all across the Tajik Mountains, um, I thought how amazing it would be just to do um, a full traverse of the Tajik Mountains from the northwest uh, near the Uzbek border, right across to the, the Waha Corridor um, where the border with Afghanistan is. Um, I've I have a map, this is a map, one to 500,000. It's, it's made by Markus Hauser. And, um, and there were all these dotted lines that indicated there were trekking routes and you could all connect them. And that's also a little bit what we've done with the, the, the guidebook. Um, so people can create their own longer track. Uh, and as an extension of that, I thought, well, wow. This, I mean, it is possible to stay in the mountains for uh, over a thousand kilometers. Um, I measured it was about 67 stages and 25 kilometers vertical ascent. Um, so I tried what what I try try to do online is just to see if I could connect the dots between the areas that all I already know and the areas that um, that are still unknown. And uh, it might it's a bit of a challenge, but it's not as hard as you would think it is. So. Uh, and uh, the reason why, also why I wanted to have sort of a branded trail um, is that you've got uh, track, trekking routes like Everest Base Camp and even the Great Himalaya Trail, uh, the Jordan Trail. So there's so many branded trails that get a lot of attention. Uh, and for Tajikistan, although we have the book, you know, it's still lots of, lots of areas in the Tajik Mountains miss out on, uh, on, on, on the tourism dollar. So... Um, yeah, I thought, how great would it be if you create a trail that runs along, you know, a lot of homestays and places where there's potential for homestays um, and, uh, and, and, and create business and employment opportunities for guides, cooks, uh, people with pack animals, um, uh, because it is possible. Uh, you, you can make this fantastic long distance trail that, uh, that could benefit the local, local economy as well. So yeah, that's, that's the, the reason why I started it. Yeah, the, the trail is actually the red line. And I don't know if it's well visible, but you see, especially um, at the further right, it's going through really high altitude uh, terrain. So, but um, th there, are, there should be trails. Uh, I still need to find out a few, research a few areas, but um, uh, I'm sure we can, we can forge your way through, uh, through, through the mountains there. Yeah, so, um, I mean, it sounds amazing. So where is the project at at the moment? So um, I'm in touch with, what I'm trying to do now is find uh, trail experts who can fill in the blanks on the map for me. We have, uh, through the book research, we already mapped tw 29 stages. Uh, primarily in the central and southern Pamirs and in the, um, the eastern part of the Zerashan range, which is uh, uh, the left top. 
um, but the northern Pamirs and the eastern part of the Zerasone range is still quite quite a an, uh, yeah an unknown area for myself. Uh, uh, but I'm in touch with a few trail experts who have lived in Tajikistan, and they, you know, they um, uh, they know the place much better than me. So I'm, I I tend to work with others to make this amazing trail happening. I mean, uh, I'm not I, I don't know everything, and I also have a family. I live in Kampala. I have a family here, so I can't just go away uh, for another four months. Uh, so yeah, I'm looking for people to work with, uh, and also I'm I'm looking for some funding because uh, it, it's remote. And with that lack of time, I, uh, I probably need to invest in some, you know, in hiring a private vehicle. Uh, I also want to employ local guides to also g give them a taster uh, what it's like to guide uh, foreign tourists around in their mountains. And, and maybe they will get inspired and think of it as a, as a potential job. So, uh, yeah, so uh, at the moment I claimed PamirTrail.org uh, and that, that, that's going to be the platform uh, I want to share my um, uh, the information and, and about the project and uh, uh, and inspire people to try and do it. Uh, the early adopters. So the the biggest challenge at the moment is it that northern and eastern section. Um, yeah, that's the biggest challenge. Uh, so next year, uh, here I am again. So next. Next year, I'm, um, I'm, uh, I hope I can guide the trip that was, I was supposed to guide uh, this year uh, in the southern Pamirs. And uh, I will extend my trip and try to go to the northern Pamirs, uh, hook up with some local trail experts and, uh, and see if we can uh, find an interesting route that, yeah, that, that goes along the villages that deserve some, uh, some, more, uh, some more traffic from tourists. So, um, uh, yeah, quite exciting. And I guess so far, have you been doing it, those sections? Have you been doing that off the, um, the Russian mapping? Those one to 50? Yeah. 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 And are they, are they quite up to date in terms of like how much the trails have moved? Obviously, maybe disregarding river bridges and things moving. Um, um, well, there were, they were made in the um, late 80s, early 90s. So some some things have have changed in terms of uh, uh, pathways may have faded because shepherds. Uh, that there are there are plenty of valleys where shepherds don't come anymore. Um, so the trails are not maintained, and therefore uh, the, the trail vanishes, and, uh, um, and it's just walking wild essentially. Uh, obviously, glaciers have retreated quite dramatically as well, also in Tajikistan. Um, but then again, the, in the bigger picture, the, you know, the, the geography remains the same. So you can still navigate properly uh, with these, these maps. I always put them in, a, in, a photo, in Photoshop, try to stitch them, and then print them out, laminate them, and then I'm walking around with this. Sort of like a big laminated map. People think I'm crazy. Why, why not use a phone? But <laughs> I love maps. So. <laughs> well, and phones run out of battery, don't they? They don't run out of battery, no. Yeah. yeah physical maps are much better. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I suppose, I guess all the way through, haven't we, we've talked about the need for planning. Um, and I know that you're planning to be out there in 2021 and 2022 in the summer. Um, so how much preparation have you already done for those trips? Uh, apart from contacting the, the people who know the areas that I don't really know, not so much because, uh, yeah, in all honesty, I've, I've, been, um, I've been lucky enough to visit Tajikistan five times. So for me, it's, in some ways, it's quite, quite a routine. Uh, I, I can just pack my stuff. I know what I need. And, uh, and I've got my local contacts as well, which is quite handy. Uh, and off I go. So, but then the, the planning part is important in terms of just choosing the right route. Otherwise, you waste a lot of time. So that's why I want to hook up with the, the, those local trail experts to, uh, to avoid wasting time and going into a wrong valley where you have to go back. Uh, so I need to know that the route is doable before, before I set out. Yeah. And are you, um, are you going to collaborate with Christine again and her organization? 
Uh, maybe with our organization, yeah. So um, for 2021, we're uh, planning uh, a part of the, the Pamir Trail, so in the Southern Pamirs. And, um, and she asked me if I, I was interested in uh, bringing along an intern uh, who could um, just see the, the, the tricks of the, the trade. How do you, how do you say that? Uh, you know, how, how, what the job is like. Um, so yeah, I intend to uh, to work uh, with Christine and her organization to uh, uh, yeah to to get more female guides. Um, it would be amazing. It'd be great. So if people want to support you, um, you've got a GoFundMe fundraiser going, don't you? Uh, which yeah, we can post to on the website and um, on Facebook, and we can probably pop it on Zoom somewhere. Um, so yeah, so people can find that and support you um and this amazing project if um yeah yeah that would, thank you that would be amazing so the, i just want to emphasize that the money is not going to uh tickets because that's paid for by the you know the companies i work for it's really about local logistics and uh uh and going to these remote places to see you know where we can put homestays where bridges are needed, where trail maintenance is needed. Uh, so to do a first uh, recce uh, survey. Uh, and with that, we try to uh, kind of get a, uh, like a, a, a good picture with film, with photography, um, and also trail descriptions. Um, just to get the, the, the yeah, to, to have like a, a package for the second phase which is uh, empowering uh, locals to, to, to uh, become a guide, to become cooks, to work as, um, you know, work with pack animals. Um, so basically training, training and, uh, and building capacity locally. And of course, build bridges and, uh, and, and actually do the trail maintenance. But that, you know, you need a lot more money for that. So that's, that's the second phase. First, we need to establish this trail and get a definite, definite route. And uh, once that, that's done, you know, we can uh, move on to the uh, next phase. I think what's really brilliant about it is that you are collaborating with local communities and you're not just going in and saying, yes, this is what the trail's gonna be um, and I'm gonna dictate what it all is. Like you are, yeah, collaborating and working with them and, you know, trying to, like be supportive of that local economy. Um, yeah, that's the, the the main point. I mean, of course, it's great to have a, an adventurous trail. But, um, you know, if if the locals just see all these foreigners passing by and and they're not spending any money or they're not then they're not getting involved in the in the project, uh, it's I think it would be a waste. Um, yeah, so. With them, um, with local Tajik people, you know, have you spoken to them about the trail already? You know, with your contacts, I'm guessing you have. Um, and is there an appetite for it? Uh, yeah, I have. Uh, I've got the um, there's there's a uh, in the north in Hujan, there's a, an organisation called Paramount Journey, uh, and uh, you know they operate in this area and they uh, are the ones that hire local guides and. Uh, pack animals and so and they think it's a great idea and they they love help you know they're going to help me out um wrecking some some of the the trail as well so um yeah i haven't told too many people yet because it needs to kind of crystallize a little bit and uh but of course once i'm there i'll just try to get them all involved and uh <laughs> and uh and see how we can do it all together yeah yeah oh no it sounds absolutely amazing um I suppose to bring it back to Tajikistan in general, um, you mentioned, you know, if you can do Scotland, you can do Tajikistan. Um, but, you know, if people can't get there at the moment for, you know, travel reasons and restrictions, um, what would you say people could do to, yeah, either train for Tajikistan or experience something similar? Or is it just a completely unique experience? Um, I think the closest, um in near Europe is Morocco, probably uh, terrain wise, Morocco in springtime, uh, not necessarily Morocco in summer. Um, but I think if you train, even if you train on your local hill, uh, you know, you, 
it's all about the fi the fitness and uh, practicing packing your rucksack, uh, pra practicing actually going out with your rucksack, go camping somewhere, uh, and find a routine because it's all about routine, um, and uh, you know f finding what what works best for you. Also equipment wise, because um, of course it's yeah. It, it, if if your boots uh, don't really fit properly or the, the rucksack is not it doesn't really fit properly so it's all yeah you just need to do a few practice runs on your local hills and uh and and make sure you're fit but don't overtrain because i i know plenty of people who train too hard for this kind of stuff and then they get injured and they can't go on a track so um train sensibly a few times a week <laughs> not too much i don't overdo it <laughs> Don't overdo it, no. <laughs> um, I think we probably need to wrap up soon, but I guess what are you most looking forward to when you get back to Tajikistan? Uh, I guess just waking up in my tent, opening the tent, seeing a fantastic mountain landscape with nobody around. That's what I'm looking forward to, yeah. Uh, the yeah. solitude, the, the solitude and the, the remoteness that that's the environment uh, yeah, I'd love to be in. So, uh, yeah. I guess you can try and experience that by finding a nice remote hill somewhere. <laughs> yeah, just, uh, I, I guess, yeah. I mean, adventure is really around the corner. And uh, I mean, in Kapala, it's a bit harder. Uh, but even here, you, you go across... To, the lake with a boat and you can find um, some some quiet spots so and i'm sure mm -hmm. in britain and uh in other places in europe it's 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 not different yeah just just have to keep your eyes open yeah well jan thank you so much for talking to us about trekking in tajikistan and the pamir trail um yeah it's been so nice to actually delve into the country and learn so much about it because yeah, as I said, it was going through production, this book, when I joined, and it's really nice to see it as a finished product um, and to talk to you about it. So thank you so much for joining us, and I hope people have been inspired. I hope so too. Uh, it was a pleasure, Amy. Th thank you for having me. Yeah, and uh, best of luck with, yeah, setting up the Pamir Trail, and I'm sure you'll give Cicero an update about it. Um, we'll, yeah, keep oh, you updated. I, <laughs> I will do, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us and for asking so many brilliant questions. Um, I hope we managed to ask all of them to Jan. Um, this is the final of our series of this block of live events. Um, so yeah, thank you. If you've, I know we've had some regular people that have joined us all the way through. Um, so thank you so much. Um, if you've joined us for this one and you want to go and watch the others, um, you can do. They're all on our YouTube channel. On the website they're all on facebook um, we are going to be running more live events in the future so you can um, find our events page on the cicerone website um, and we'll be putting information up on there and also um, if you like the cicerone press facebook page and um, they'll all come up for you there as well um, so yeah so thank you very much uh, you can also get involved in cicerone in lots of other ways you can join our Cicerone Connect Facebook group, um, which is a lovely community. You can also sign up for our newsletter. Um, and as I said, visit cicerone.co.uk forward slash events um, to find out about, yeah, future events that we're running. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and hopefully you've been inspired about trekking in Tajikistan. And um, yeah, if you want to use that discount, um, you can go to the Cicero website and order a copy for 25% off. So, thank you very much. <laughs>